Um, so, um, I'm delighted again to be moderating the Global Economic Outlook after what one has to agree was rather an unusual warm-up act. Um, I am very disappointed, however, that for some reason they forgot to provide the band. <laughs> Which I think we would have enjoyed very much. Um, the previous speakers said three things with which I think we can all agree. Um, that growth is very important, uh, that jobs are very important, and trade needs to be free um, and perceived, and I agree with this, to be fair. And uh, I think those three points, growth, jobs, and the nature of the trading system, are pretty important for our discussions uh, now. We are meeting at a point in which I think for pretty well the first time since uh, January 2008, the, the WEF has a tendency to be a bit behind the times. So it didn't fully realize at that time just how bad it was going to be. But since so 10 years of extraordinarily global economic optimism and about a widely shared and synchronized recovery. So we will discuss the nature of that recovery, the risks both in both directions to it, and some of the longer term opportunities and challenges it creates. And to do so very, if I may introduce the panel very, very quickly, because you know, I think everybody here, I have Christine Lagarde to my left. I think she's been a member of this panel for a quite a long time. Um, uh, to her That's left, she's obviously the Managing <laughs> Director of the International Monetary Fund. To her left is Mark Carney, who is, to me, the governor. But of course, to others, is merely the governor of the Bank of England. And the central banks have so many governors, after all. Uh, to his left is Carrie Lam, who's the chief executive of Hong Kong. And to her left is Haruhiko Kuroda, um, Governor of the Bank of Japan, who has actually been a friend of mine for 40 years. We met at Oxford. Um, and to his left uh, is Mary Callahan Edos, who's Chief Executive Officer of JP Morgan's Asset and Wealth Management, whom I've met and shared panels with now on quite a few occasions. And I'm looking forward very much to this, uh, to this one. So let's start with the short-term economic outlook. And you've just recently at the IMF produced your update, which is wonderfully cheerful in every respect, and <laughs> forecasting 3.9% growth for the world this year and next. So what could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, let's celebrate what could go right for the moment, because we, we do have, uh, we are in a sweet spot, as I've said. 3.9, 3.9, 2018, 2019, it's not bad. What I think is even more interesting is that about 120 countries have actually seen their growth increase last year. And we only have about one fifth of the emerging and developing countries that are seeing their GDP on a per capita basis decline. So it's, it's well spread out and it's uh, shared between advanced economies, emerging market economies, and the Part of the world that I would certainly worry most about is Sub-Saharan Africa, where we have a combination of factors that lead to that uh, lower uh, income per capita. I think we, we should celebrate. We don't do that so often. And at the IMF, we identify uh, negative and downside risks in the most. But we, su we should celebrate the policies that have been implemented by policymakers, and in particular by central bankers. I think one of the reasons we are in that sweet spot at, at the moment it's a cyclical upswing, let's face it, but it's largely attributable to policies that have been implemented. Uh, monetary accommodative policies that we had no idea about uh, 10 years ago. Fiscal policies in many corners of, as well, which have been reasonably good. It's debatable uh, what was done exactly, say, eight years ago. But in the main, it's the result of, of good policies. What could go wrong? Um, I'll, I'll mention three vulnerabilities as I see them. First of all, financial vulnerabilities, 
And while the US tax reform certainly will have positive effects in the short term for the US and for other countries around, it might also lead to serious risks. And we can discuss that later if you want. Uh, and that has an impact on the financial vulnerabilities, particularly given the high asset prices that we see around the world and the easy financing that is still available. I would say that the second risk, which is short and medium term, but needs to be addressed in the short term, is the excessive inequalities that in many places are growing and creating those fractures that uh, Klaus has identified as one of the themes of the uh, World Economic Forum this year. And I would say that the third uh, downside or risks that I see uh, is the lack of international cooperation and the geopolitical risks that could be created as a result. I'll stop here, but happy to comment on any of those three. Well, these are huge points, and we will certainly come back to them. <laughs> um, let's turn to one of the central bankers who has produced uh, these outcomes. Um, <laughs> Uh, central bankers have certainly become con controversial. <laughs> they have been described by a well-known authority as the only game in town. Mm. And um, I think many of us feel that's probably truer of Japan than anywhere else. Um, <laughs> so that there were three arrows, and yours is certainly the arrow that's gone furthest, uh, uh, Mr. Kuroda. So tell us about your remarkable monetary policy, its success, Mm. and how you're going to get out of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, <clears throat> let me first explain the current status of uh, the Japanese economy. The economy is uh, expanding uh, moderately, supported by both domestic and external demand in a well-balanced manner. Real GDP has continued to grow for seven consecutive quarters and the average growth rate during that period is close to 2%. Uh, since uh, Japan's potential growth rate at this moment is slightly less than 1%, 2% uh, 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 growth in the last uh, seven quarters uh, is a, a really uh, a substantial improvement. And the unemployment rate has declined to uh, less than 3%, actually 2.7%, which is, uh, even in the Japanese context, uh, uh, is uh, really uh, full employment. And the current economic recovery has lasted for over 60 months, and this is the second longest boom in the post-war era. Going forward, uh, Japan's economy is likely to continue its moderate expansion, uh, uh, so called of virtuous cycle from income to spending is expected to be maintained in both the corporate uh, as well as, uh, as uh, uh, household sector on the back of highly accommodative uh, financial conditions. On the price front, uh, annual consumer price inflation excluding fresh food has been approaching 1%, but has remained slightly positive, excluding the effect of energy prices. In Japan, a contrast between strong economic recovery and relatively weak uh, prices stand out as much as or even more than in the US and Europe. However, we think that with the, uh, the output gap further improving and labor market conditions steadily tightening, Firms' uh, price setting stance is expected to become gradually bullish, and medium to long term inflation expectations are projected to rise. So, while uh, consumer price inflation is likely to increase toward the price stability target of 2%, the deflationary mindset entrenched among people under prolonged deflation has been more tenacious than expected. Therefore, uh, the Bank of Japan will continue to support Japan's economy and prices by pursuing powerful monetary easing with uh, persistence under the so-called quantitative and qualitative monetary easing with yield curve control. There are various, of course, risks uh, in the short to medium term, but 
uh, from my perspective, they are mostly uh, external, including some geopolitical risks. Can I just follow up on one question, because it's one that is more generally discussed, and it's an issue that you face in a way that Mark Carney doesn't. <laughs> so here you have an economy that is growing significantly above trend for a length, quite an extended period. You have unemployment at 2.7%, and which is clearly very low, and falling. And you announced when you became governor, the, uh, not you, the government and the Bank of Japan together, that you would hit an inflation target of 2%, which didn't seem, most people would say, mm. if the economy was like this, you would have got there. Mm. So why is there no inflation? <laughs> what I, do you think is going on, and how does that fit with what we're seeing in many other okay. areas like Eurozone and the United <clears throat> States as well? I think uh, there are two uh, factors behind rather slow response uh, of prices and wages to uh, uh, strong economic uh, growth. One is uh, sort of universal uh, common factor like uh, globalization, uh, new technologies, uh, uh, even Amazon effect and so on and so forth. All of them may make uh, 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 inflation uh, rather subdued. This is a universal mm -hmm. factor. But second, uh, Japan specific factor is, as I just said in my initial remark, uh, that is to say, after 15 year long deflation from 1998 through 2013, deflationary mindset, uh, people expect uh, prices and wages do not rise. Uh, and this kind of mindset is rather strong. And it's not so easy to eradicate this kind of uh, mindset uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, Japanese uh, households as well as uh, companies. But, uh, there are some indication that uh, uh, wages are actually rising, and some uh, prices have already started to rise, and even uh, medium to long-term inflation expectations, which had been so weak in the last uh, couple of years, are now slightly picking up. So. Uh, there are many factors which made uh, uh, achieving 2% uh, inflation target or price stability target so uh, difficult and, and time consuming, but uh, I think uh, we are finally close to the target. Okay. <laughs> um, we hope so, for, <laughs> since you promised the government that you would deliver it. Um, Mark Carney, you don't have the problem of low inflation at the moment. <laughs> uh, you do have the problem of managing monetary policy in the face of some strange decision that British people, God bless them, <laughs> took in June 2016, one which probably those who have ever read me will realize I wasn't wildly enthusiastic about. Um, you have started a tiny increase in interest rates, so a step towards normalization. How do you perceive the monetary policy challenges for you and other central banks in similar situations ahead in this strange environment of strong growth, but still generally contained inflation, and um, uh, where, among the other things people are concerned about, is that the, this normalization process might reveal more financial fragility than is now evident. So what is the, the path forward? Okay. In the next, what, 15 minutes? Should I answer that? Uh, um, you can I, do it in two minutes. I'll I do it in two can. minutes. To do it in two minutes, um, <laughs> let, me, let me generalize um, and talk about the overall uh, normalization good. challenge, if I could. And if I could pick up on some of what uh, both we just heard. The nature of the, um, of the expansion, the recovery, is, as the IMF has just indicated, it's stronger. It's getting up to around 4%. It's broader. It's 90% of economies growing faster than potential, so slack is being used up. And it's also healthier. Um, the, for, I'll give you one example. In terms of the acceleration of G7 growth in the last year, 
80%, 80% plus of that has been investment picking up and net trade picking up. Yeah. So this, it's, this is not a consumer boom led uh, recovery, this uh, 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 acceleration. Um, and all of those have consequences for normalization as you can anticipate. So the first slack being used up is the Phillips curve uh, coming back, uh, that's the question, in the face of bigger secular pressures, globalization technology, as, as Crotasan just mentioned, and all of us have been discussing over the course of this, uh, of this week and, and at other times. I think a crucial point is as you get towards full employment, uh, as the output gap shifts, they call it a Phillips curve for a reason, um, and you start to uh, you start to see the um, uh, the uh, convex element of the slope. So the pickup should be there or should begin, maybe not quite to historic uh, degrees. Um, so we have to be cautious, but should come. And if you look at wage behavior in the U.S. Um, in the UK, uh, some of the other, uh, well, I, maybe I shouldn't speak for other economies, but you see that firming of of, of wages, which once you adjust for poor productivity growth and um, some underemployment and up until very recently a relatively low level of churn in the labor market, it starts to, it starts to fit together at least directionally. So um, there's that aspect which is, um, uh, which is pushing up. The second element uh, on, on uh, t pushing towards normalization, I should say, of policy, the second element is that healthier a bit, more investment uh, as part of the recovery, so investment picking up relative to savings, and we've seen, as you know, a big shift in fiscal policy. Uh, think on average advanced economies about a two, two and a half percent drag from fiscal policy 2010-2014, uh, now adding, depending on how you use multipliers, particularly for the U.S., <coughs> but adding to growth, um, maybe half a percent or so uh, on average across the G7, somewhere in mm -hmm. that zone. Yeah. So, but that's a big, big swing. So investment up, savings down, pushing up on the equilibrium rate of interest. Um, the third element of that um, I'd, I'd highlight is just the, the stance of policy as a whole of, uh, if I could use the term for, for these purposes, the G4. So the, the, the members of the G7 who um, were uh, practicing quantitative easing, um, and if you look at the flow of net fiscal, fiscal issuance minus what uh, the bonds being taken out, um, of, of the market by asset purchases, whether it was the BOJ or the ECB or the Bank of England or the Fed, we've shifted from, collectively, uh, 2013 to 2017, basically no net flow or, or even bonds being taken out on net, to this year on the order of magnitude of about a trillion dollars of net issuance on, based on announced plans and potentially that going up to a trillion five or, or higher next year. So that one would expect uh, to push up on, on rates. Um, so in, in the context of normalization, you have a sort of real economy providing some support for it. Um, you have some technical factors which play into it. You have a very tough judgment to be made around where is the equilibrium rate of interest which has been very, very low and arguably should be raising a bit. You can make a judgment about direction, but probably not, certainly not with any precision about degree. Um, and so that's going to require, um, one has a sense of direction, I would say, as a whole for the central banks, a regime shift in terms of towards normalization, but um, a requirement for each of us to be quite prudent and patient as appropriate mm. in making those judgments. Last thing I will say, and I'm not going to expand on it unless you want, I mean, the UK is in a relatively unique situa situation in that over the course of the next year, as the negotiations with the EU27 progress, we're going to find a lot more about what uh, the supply capacity of the economy is in the near term, what the right level of the exchange rate should be, whether or not there are going to be tariff or other trade costs, um, and how all of this affects demand. And of course, it is all of those factors together which determine the appropriate stance of monetary policy. <laughs> Let me ask one follow-up question, because before we go to the... I was trying to run out the clock. Yeah, I will, I will come back to that in a moment. Yeah. Um, you have had a central role through the Financial Stability Board in the, strengthening the global financial system. 
I get, you know, every time I write on this, sort of hundreds and hundreds of comments below on the lines of, these crazy central banks have already, and if they haven't already, will soon have created the most unmanageable asset price bubble ever, the Omni bubble. <laughs> it will burst, probably when you, as and when you raise rate, you collectively, and the crash will lead to total meltdown of um, yeah. this, this sort of thing. On a scale of one to 10, <laughs> how likely <coughs> is that? Which way Should, is the, yeah. Yeah, you can choose. <laughs> one, zero, one, zero risk, essentially, go ahead, all of you people, Look, go I away and not worry at all, and 10, run away and get a big umbrella because the, world, the house is going right. to fall down on you. Two points. Um, it's a composite probability. Um, what's the probability there'll be an adjustment in asset prices? Yeah, that probability has gone up. If you look at um, corporate bond spreads, high yield spreads, they're at near all-time lows. Last seen, you know, just before LTC, CM, just before the uh, global financial crisis, in a rising rate environment, if indeed that is the right uh, uh, stance of policy, one would expect some adjustment there, other asset prices accordingly. I think the big question is not, you know, the market will find the right level for assets. The question is whether the core of the financial system is in a position that is going to amplify those movements uh, in an adverse way and there will be a feedback to the real economy. And on that, that component of the probability, I would put that as quite low because it's not just the regulators, it's the financial institutions represented here um, and across the world that have really transformed the liquidity and capital positions of the institutions. I'll give you the very quick numbers, um, if I may. Pre-crisis, uh, the coverage of short-term liabilities for banks, the major banks, particularly in the UK, um, plus their access to central bank facilities was 10%. Now it's 110%. So they're fully covered, both their own liquidity and their access to our liquidity on all their short-term wholesale liabilities. That is a huge move. Second uh, figure, and people can debate about it, we've had healthy debates on it, um, but the overall level of capital standards have gone up 10 times, but the actual levels of capital um, have gone up about five times for the major banks, apples to apples comparison in terms of capital. That's a huge shift, and it's the type of shift in the judgment of the Bank of England, um, and, and I'll be around if, if this uh, judgment is tested, um, that would put, allow that system to withstand a shock of a disorderly Brexit, which is a big call, but we're confident in terms of the orders of magnitude because we've tested it. And then the last point is we're not all the way there to ending too big to fail, but we have made a huge amount of progress in terms of reshaping and the institutions reshaping their, their business lines, being able to separate their high street or their retail component of their banking, and adding on top of all that capital big layers of bail-inable debt. For the UK, and I'll stop with this, the major banks have 25% total loss-absorbing capacity. So even if they go through that capital, there's another layer of securities that are held by institutional investors, some of whom represented in this room, um, who would find out that they're no longer <laughs> debt holders, but they're equity holders. So all of that um, provides real shock absorbing capacity for the core of the system. That is not to say that asset prices couldn't change, but it's to provide a measure of confidence that if and when they do, even if they are sharp changes, uh, that the system isn't going to amplify the, uh, that impact. I think this is incredibly important. So the conclusion I would draw are two. Um, one is that all those uh, commenters, and possibly there are one or two in the audience who are just worried that the whole world will fall apart in the next couple of years because policy normalization and asset price collapses should calm down and feel completely and utterly relaxed. And the second conclusion, which is completely personal, that if there are any politicians in the world who are telling us that the continually rising stock market is an indication of how successful they are, they might find the central banks again and again in the way. Um, uh, let me turn to um, uh, let me turn to you, Carrie Lam. Um, Tell us about how the world looks from your perspective, both in Hong Kong as this core part of the Asian economy, financial center, and if you can, about the rather large place <laughs> with which you're closely connected and to your north. Yes. 
Well, as a small and externally oriented economy, but at the same time, one of the freest and most competitive economies in the world, Hong Kong certainly benefits from the global economic recovery. So uh, we are doing very well last year. We are projecting the full year growth for 2017 at no less than 3.7% in real terms, which uh, is considerably higher than the 2% in the preceding year, that is 2016. Uh, Christine kept on reminding us that uh, while the sun is out, fix the roof. I'm pleased to tell you that I have not discovered a leaking roof in Hong Kong yet. But uh, similarly, while the sun is out, it's always good to strengthen the foundation. Strengthening the foundation will enable Hong Kong to seize the many opportunities available to us arising from China's economic policy and also Asia because Asia's growth now accounts for 60% of the GDP growth worldwide, mm. and China alone is 30% um, contribution. So um, this session is about global economic uh, situation. I will not be doing justice if I just talk about this small economy of uh, Hong Kong. Uh, so if one looks at the China economic policy, which will be very relevant for Hong Kong, because President Xi Jinping said in his 19th Congress report that he will support, the central government will support Hong Kong being integrated in the national development strategy. Last year, President Xi delivered two very important speeches internationally. One, of course, is in this forum at the last year's Davos in January last year. But at that time, I suspect that uh, the global economic recovery was not very certain. So uh, President Xi was talking about leaders uh, in various economies should shoulder joint responsibility to propel the economic growth uh, globally. And then in November last year, which Christine and I were also there at the APAC meeting, CEO summit, at that point in time, I think um, everybody was very assured that there is now very bright signs of economic recovery. So President Xi talked about that we should really um, seize the opportunity of a global economy in transition to accelerate the growth of Asia Pacific. So putting in that context, uh, I try to summarize for our distinguished guests the gist of the economic policy of China, in my view, based on my reading of the two speeches, is how China will continue to uphold free trade and economic globalization that we should adapt to it and guide it and cushion its negative impact and deliver its benefits to all. Because if economic benefits are not shared by all, all economies will face one problem or the other. And it should be more reinvigorated, more inclusive, and more sustainable. So with that in mind, since the world is now seeing some driving forces for growth, I feel we should take this opportunity to improve governance, to focus on more trade rules, to have more regulatory collaboration between central bankers and uh, regulatory authorities, to put in place sound social policies, to address issues that Christine has reminded us also, poverty, income disparity, and lack of opportunities, particularly for the young people. So I would um, just like to say that in this term of a government, I will embrace those uh, values. And although we do not practice state planning <laughs> under the basic law, we are still a free capitalist economy. But we will embrace those uh, values uh, to put in place the necessary social policies to make timely investments in education, to enhance connectivity with the rest of the world, particularly with ASEAN. So last November, we signed the FTA with ASEAN and we are negotiating several free trade agreements at this moment. So uh, I remain very optimistic about the short to medium term future of Hong Kong. But as I said, since we are so externally oriented, please keep those tsunami away from us and then we will be safe. <laughs> Thank you. May I, this is difficult, but I don't think we can avoid it. Just to ask one follow up question, and I'm going to also discuss this with Mary Adults. Um, President Trump, when he spoke here, I think the most substantive thing, I think, for this audience and this panel is what he said about trade policy. And he said two quite interesting things, one of which was new, and we'll come to that in a moment, and one more traditional. He talked very explicitly 
and it's not new, about countries, though he didn't name names, which are perceived to misbehave on intellectual property and countries that are pursuing industrial policies with government subsidies. I think he used that, that word. And it's surely no great secret that when he says that, he's thinking about China. Um, and there are those of us who are very concerned at the risk of serious trade conflict. And we have, of course, at the beginning of this week, seen relatively minor actions uh, in this <laughs> regard. From your perspective, as a, running a very open economy, great trading place, connected to China and, of course, to the US too, how concerned are people where you are that this actually might prove a very destructive development? How do you perceive that risk? Well, of course, as I mentioned, being such an externally oriented economy and so dependent on free trade, we would not like to see any uh, trade uh, conflicts or trade wars, so to speak. But um, trade deficit is not something that we are not used to. I remember uh, at a session that uh, I shared with uh, President Trump at APAC, I gave him a figure. I said, uh, Mr. President, the largest trade surplus that America has is with this small economy called Hong Kong <laughs> at 31 billion US dollars a year. And he seemed to be quite pleased with that. <laughs> so um, I, I- And you didn't would, threaten uh, him with uh, protection. <laughs> he did not mention his way, he did not mention his way just now. Uh, so uh, coming back to uh, China, as I mentioned, uh, from President Xi's uh, um, discussions in the two speeches, China is still a developing economy, so it will evolve and build in those things that will make uh, trade more transparent, uh, fairer to everybody. But the fairness must be to everybody. Um, if I may turn to you, um, Mary Eddowes. Um, I'm very much interested to see whether there's anything in the sort of overall picture of the world that has been presented by these various distinguished representatives of the official sector you disagree with. <laughs> and I would be particularly interested in your perspective from where you are on the impact of the tax reform, which is obviously a very big issue, and possibly on financial fragility as a representative, very, very leading representative of the private financial sector. You know, I can't help but sit here, and we're all uh, in this audience. This is the last panel of the 2018 uh, Davos event. And when we think about where we've come from and what we just heard from all the major economies around the world, I think we first and foremost have to thank Mr. and Mrs. Schwab for bringing us together to be committed to improving the state of the world because the vision to bring together not just policymakers in one area and central bankers in another and CEOs in another and philanthropists in another, but all together to import and export the best thinking so that, and especially after the great financial crisis, how do we get back on a road where we don't have a boom and bust cycle? And here we sit nine years later we could be in our second recession post then had we had the regular ups and downs. And we have a global economy that is expanding almost universally. And it is because you look at the people up here on stage and the other central bankers and policymakers around the world, and you think to yourself how incredibly complicated this was to pull off. Nine years, $11 trillion put back into the system but not in an in a unthought through manner. So that we are sitting here and we have these people who have worked tires, tirelessly. It is so incredibly complicated to have gotten this right. And what you've done for all of us, especially the investors of the world, to be able to invest in that on behalf of all the pensioners around the world who will benefit from that as they move towards their retirement, I cannot thank you enough for that. And I can also not thank you enough for giving all of these government jobs such a fabulous prestige and something that I know all of us now perhaps aspire to do even more so than in the past. And we thank you for that. Wow.
Thank you. It's fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> That's the nicest thing I've ever heard said about Central Bank. <laughs> so, so thank you all for coming, Mark. No, um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, the, all the official sector should feel <laughs> extraordinarily happy. I'm waiting for the but. <laughs> there is no but. Oh, good. The, 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 it, and... And therefore, it is incumbent on us as investors to watch what they're doing and to not miss a beat and not sit here and think about the greatest worry in Davos that I've heard for the past several days is that there's not enough worry. <laughs> people are worried that people aren't worried. And it's okay to not be worried. It's okay, as Madame Lagarde said, to celebrate where we are, how we got here, and to not miss a beat on investing so that people can benefit from that, so that all the people around the world who can have access to public markets can be able to participate in the recovery of what has happened and to continue to do so. And so the, the opportunities, we can talk about them in the U.S., but they're really almost everywhere. U.S., Europe, emerging economies, being able to have participation in these companies, taking these policies and putting them back to work and reinvesting in their own communities and in their own products and services is exactly what our job is to do. Do you want to say anything about the great tax cut and how it's going to impact the U.S. and the world? You know, the great <laughs> tax cut is really the great tax normalization. The U.S. was just out of whack. Um, and so the fact that we got it done was a, was a very important move for the U.S. competitive nature. How that goes back into play, I think, is the thing that's so exciting for the rest of the world, because what happens in the U.S. can often be contagious for other companies that exist in a multinational fashion or just in their, in their own nations. And so the fact that the CEOs in the United States of America are not just doing one thing with those tax cuts, but doing multiple things. They're taking that money and they're helping the shareholders. You see more buybacks, you see more dividend payments. They're helping the customers of the companies. You will see much more M&A to get better products and services. You see much more CapEx. And then very importantly, they're helping their employees. So it's not just the one-time bonuses that we've heard about. It is wage increases. It is health care support. It is being able to help them and, in, and increase their retirement benefits. So it's being able to help them to continue to participate that. And then additionally, companies are also taking that money and putting it back into their own philanthropic efforts efforts in the communities that they serve, in the job retraining. And so if you can continue to see that across America, that is what capitalism is all about. I'm going to move on now to, uh, unless somebody wants to add on the shorter term risks, to the longer term opportunity. Um, uh, I think the IMF was the first to say we should fix our uh, roofs while the sun shines. I think it's as you, the, 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 FT, the fund has been rather good on uh, uh, um, metaphors and various things of this kind in the, in the last uh, few years, so I like that. Uh, and it's no longer the new mo mediocre, which is nice. Um, so the big issue people are focused on is the feeble state of productivity growth. Some people seem to think tax cuts will be enough. Um, but what is, what is your view, uh, Christine Lagarde, of the, of the agenda of fixing the roof, and particularly to, to make sure the cyclical recovery, and it clearly is a cyclical recovery, will be turned into an uptick in trend growth mm. across the world? Thank you, Martin couple of things that I would like to point out to. One is uh, the productivity numbers that we have are not satisfactory. Uh, productivity prior to the financial crisis was about 1%, which was not particularly high. It's now down to 0.3% in the advanced economies. So that needs to be addressed. Second point is the potential growth needs to be improved as well. Because while we are in a sweet spot at the moment, it's not going to last forever. And clearly, many of the economies that are growing nicely at the moment are growing above potential, which in and of itself presents risks. So growth potential enhancing reforms, which are going to be country specific. I'm not going to give you a laundry list because it's going to be country specific. Each country has a roof of its, of its own. Need to focus on those two aspects. 
If I can just focus on productivity for a second, and that will touch on something which I mentioned earlier on as one of the downside risks, which is lack of international cooperation. To address productivity, or the lagging productivity that we have, we need to invest in research, development, and facilitate innovation. No question about that. We need more trade rather than less trade, because trade encourages competition, fosters innovation, and actually is conducive to that improved productivity. And that takes me back to my concern about lack of international cooperation. To have more trade, better trade, fair trade, free trade, reciprocal trade, we need international cooperation. And uh, the concern I have at the moment is that we tend to see a degree of common denominator, which is, yes, we all need that, but it needs a reset. We need to look at state-owned enterprise subsidies. We need to look at sharing of intellectual property rights. We need to look at constraints imposed here and there. Yes, and the IMF agrees with all, with, with all that, but it needs to be looked at in a cooperative way and through international cooperation. I think that should happen. I was particularly pleased to hear that President Trump mentioned WTO. It's one of the forums in which those things can and should happen. And uh, hopefully through improvement there, innovation that we've heard many of the leaders in the last few days focus on and uh, identify as one of the areas where they want to invest, we will improve that productivity. Final say. Well, Mary, I want to thank you so much for recognizing the efforts that we've, we've, we've uh, endeavored. Mm. I don't think that we've completed the job. Having growth is good, improving productivity is good, but making sure that the results of that growth are properly allocated, mm. are properly distributed, and that the growing inequalities that we see in advanced economies, many of them, and stabilized but still very high in emerging market economies are a threat to sustainable growth. I mean, we've done multiple research on that. I can't imagine why. I mean, we don't seem to have any pol real professional politicians on this panel, so they can't uh, respond. Can I just one, one tiny follow-up? Yeah. I was very interested, and this came up yesterday already, but he, President Trump repeated it just now, he said, if I understand him correctly, that under the right terms, the United States would consider negotiating to re-enter the TPP as a multilateral endeavor. Yeah. I think that's the first time I've heard this. So these yeah. are, you would have to regard that in terms of the trade agenda we've been hearing so much about as really rather remarkable and encouraging development, wouldn't we? Yes. I think, I think, I think we, I think I agree with you. I'm not sure it's multilateral in essence, it's plurilateral rather, but you know, better can be the enemy uh, or the best is the enemy of the good. That, that's, I think that's a really good indication. One, one more area, if I may, on where international cooperation is also key and I think favored by many countries, including the United States actually. It's the fight against corruption. We haven't talked much about it, and I don't want to spend too much time on it, but it's one area which, combined with the fight against tax evasion and profit shifting and all the rest of it, is actually vital to give more hope and uh, encourage our economies. Mark Carney, you, I think, wanted to say something on this. Yeah, and I'll, you want to speak structural, so I'll, I'll try to concentrate there, but I'll, I'll start with a cyclical point, which is that um, we should be seeing a pickup in productivity, as you can appreciate, in particular as with capital deepening. But another factor in the cyclical sense which leads to structural is that we have had up until very recently quite low job churn, certainly in the United Kingdom. And part of the diffusion process of new innovations and their application is people moving from learning at one firm and moving to a new firm or setting up a, 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 a new uh, a company. And uh, so we should get that, and particularly at a time of great innovation, that's where you get the productivity pickup. And as, you, as you're well aware, and you've written on this, um, we have a very long tail in most of our economies of quite substandard 
uh, firms, and that, I think that's one of the elements of it. It then goes to sort of structural policies around, and I know it's motherhood to say training, but the elements that facilitate people to move, set up new firms. Last point on structural, which is around trade. Uh, as people think, I mean, entirely agree with Christine's emphasis there, and also the emphasis of sharing the gains of trade, and one of the things I would suggest there could be some more thought given is the nature of the trade deals, how they can immediately provide a dividend because it's the nature of the companies that benefit. Um, people have put on in this fora over the uh, recent years free trade for SMEs uh, being an objective. Actually, we've got the, the network effects and the financing ability to change that. All of a sudden, that's an element of globalization that works for all brings productivity and brings instant diffusion, but also trade for trade in services. When you think about having a positive uh, set of discussions around trade, the lagged liberalization of services, where most of our populations work, it's not all tradable, I know, but most of our populations work, um, uh, trying to bring that up to the level of liberalization uh, that has been accomplished on goods, at least directionally, has that, the, that bigger impact, or has the potential to have that bigger impact. Does anyone else want to add something on the structural before we move on? Um, uh, Mr. Kuro. Thank you. Uh, in the Japanese uh, context, uh, the most uh, significant challenge uh, faced by the economy is uh, demographic uh, uh, change. Uh, working, a, working age population in Japan is shrinking every year by half a million to one million. So uh, since the economy is growing by 2% or so well above the growth potential, uh, not just unemployment rate uh, has declined uh, to 2.7%, but really uh, significant labor shortage is, uh, is developing in almost every sector of the economy. Uh, now, uh, the non-manufacturing sector, uh, which was compared with the U.S. Uh, non-manufacturing sector, uh, uh, less efficient, uh, uh, is now investing heavily in uh, uh, high-tech, uh, labor-saving uh, technology and investment, uh, and. Uh, uh, also robotics and AI, uh, IoT, or whatever. Uh, in Japan, because of uh, absolute labor shortage, uh, not just uh, business, but also uh, workers and trade union, they are in favor of uh, those uh, new technologies and, and labor-saving uh, investment uh, being made, and uh, that is really improving uh, labor productivity significantly, particularly in the non-manufacturing sector. So uh, in some sense, this make, uh, uh, makes uh, uh, prices uh, uh, to respond uh, rather slowly uh, to the very strong economic growth. But uh, in the long run, this uh, improvement of labor uh, uh, productivity and uh, growth potential would uh, make uh, uh, the economy uh, sustain uh, relatively high growth in coming years with hopefully uh, price stability target of 2% being uh, achieved. <laughs> Can I turn quickly, and then, because we're going to have to have time for at least three questions, as I always say, Mark Carney, if I can ask you a <laughs> uh, risk we haven't discussed, which has interested you a lot, and I think others here, um, which is that the private sector, and I want to talk, ask Mariettes about this again very, very briefly, um, the, the in internalization of what I think you call the, trage you call the tragedy of the horizon, yeah. namely climate change. Mm -hmm and uh, which most of the world still thinks is a big problem. Uh, and uh, and uh, how do you think we're getting that? Is the private sector, people here, beginning to have some recognition that this has significant business implications? 
Uh, short answer, yes. And I think, and to make it tangible, uh, let me use one example, um, which is uh, the Task Force on Climate Financial Disclosures, which is something that was set up at the request of the G20, G20 leaders. It was run by the private sector, chaired by Mike Bloomberg. And the bottom line with uh, the summit of President Macron um, in uh, December, the middle of December, uh, I'll just give you some numbers of the investor numbers that have signed up to this and with an expectation that climate disclosure is going to improve for uh, those in, uh, whom they invest uh, and whom they lend. The top 20 uh, globally uh, systemic banks, eight of the 10 world's largest asset managers, the major sovereign wealth funds, largest pension funds, um, and the two major shareholder proxy firms, Glass, Lewis, and ISS, all signed up, the rating agencies, the big four accounting firms, et cetera. 80 trillion, 80 trillion dollars of balance sheet with an expectation that working with the users of capital, uh, we're going to get into a much better place in terms of the disclosure, not just of static risks, but of strategy and governance of those risks, and hugely importantly, the opportunities as well over time, so that together, whether you're a skeptic or a true believer or a, a believer in uh, technology or, or a denier, we need a market in the transition to a lower carbon future. And now the private sector, and I salute the private sector on this because they were passed the baton by the, uh, the public sector, and uh, they're delivering, and now the question is implementation and improvement. Mary, yeah, is, is there some, I, anything you'd yes, like to add absolutely. very quickly? So, so exactly what Mark just said at the end, I think is one of the most important things for the private sector. You, it doesn't matter whether you believe in climate change or not, because while you could have a majority of this audience understanding and believing in the issues, not, it's not universally felt. And therefore, the investors of the world have to figure out how to do that. It's about the prevention of what happens when you have all these things that are happening in the world that must be addressed, irrespective of what you believe in. So if you look at a city like Amsterdam, its infrastructure is set to protect itself for a one in 10,000 year chance event. New York City, a one in 100 year. And the problem is we keep having these one in 500 year events in the United States of America. If you look at Hurricane Katrina, it cost the government $120 billion to fix something that had $10 million, 10 million been spent by the Army Corps of Engineers to figure out that there was 10 feet of wall that should have been expanded and built underneath, we could have saved the 120 billion. So you have to invest in infrastructure to protect yourself for things in the future. I think what we're gonna see from the US government is the next phase of big investments in infrastructure, asking for public-private par partnership, and I think that's the next exciting wave of what's to come. Thank you, that's very encouraging. Um, uh, and it's certainly true that the Dutch do really understand the danger of water. Um, so I'm going to take three questions. They must be one sentence. I'm very bad on timing. Say who you are. and You can address it to one person. I probably won't be able to give more than one person an uh, 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 opportunity to answer anyway. Does anybody want to ask? Is somebody right there? Yes. Please stand up and say who you are. Just, uh, Julio Estrada, Minister of Finance of Guatemala. Just a question, the productivity has been growing down over the last 10 years. Isn't there an element of that the speed of urbanization has also slowed down and the social license needed for infrastructure projects has become much more complicated? So that it's also an element, it's not just innovation, it's not just business productivity, but social productivity and the capacity to agree on doing things which has slowed their capacity and the speed of productivity. But you said slowing urbanization. Is that what you said? <laughs> yes, in developed economies. Yes. Has it slowed down and the process? I understand. Anybody else want to ask a question? Mm. Um, is there a woman here <laughs> somewhere that I can't see? <laughs> uh, yes. I think there should be gender equality, so let's go for you. Good afternoon. Giuliana Ferreino, Corriere della Sera. The world has changed. Do you think the, the target of 2% for inflation is still realistic? Very good. Is the 2% inflation target still realistic? And, okay. And I apologize to all those I won't manage. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, Paul Sheard, S&P Global. Knowing what we know now about the lessons from the financial crisis, are there any fundamental changes that you would like to see made in the macroeconomic policy framework? Is there any major things we still need to do to improve it? 
this has the great advantage of being just the, the envelope for the second question, so we don't have much time. So may I start with you, Christine Lagarde? The suggestion was made that productivity growth is slowing in part because of what some of the fundamental drivers, and particularly urbanization, is slowing. I think that is actually very important. Yeah. So that we shouldn't be surprised that productivity growth is slowing in emerging and developing countries. On the other hand, there is still a huge backlog of productivity enhancing investments they clearly can make because many of them are still so relatively poor. How does the IMF see the balance here? A bit like you just did. Oh, well, I think <laughs> Have I answered the you, question? You Dear. Still the answer. <laughs> No, but I think I think urbanization, uh, when it comes to infrastructure projects, the, the, the lag time between the beginning of the project, the financing, the implementation, and so on and so forth, that is clearly a, a, a slowing down factor. I think this is not just it. There's also population aging, maybe not so much in, the, in some of the emerging market economies. There is also, you know, delayed investment over the course of the last few years, which certainly has not helped. So the multiple factors that are actually affecting it. But... Increased urbanization certainly is one of them. Can I'd I just say one word course, on the 2% on the inflation? Course. Because I think that, that's really an interesting one. That 2% inflation was not decided randomly. I think it was very carefully calculated on the basis of, of multiple factors. There are areas in the world where certainly from our perspective, we consider that to arrive at an average 2% inflation targets or thereabout, uh, in a particular currency zone, it might be actually appropriate for some of the countries in that zone to tolerate higher inflation than that 2%. I'm going to ask the question about the inflation target of you, um, Governor Kuroda, since you've finally agreed it uh, after, as you said, um, almost two decades of deflation. Um, <laughs> And now it seems to be suggested by some that 2% is too low, and really it should be 4%, so you've got plenty of room for maneuver. What is your view where you are now? Are you, are, are you actually trying to hit very hard a target that is already outdated? Uh, I think 2% uh, uh, inflation target or price stability target is still uh, uh, meaningful, uh, relevant, and, and useful for managing uh, monetary policy. Uh, a few points. One, uh, as you may know, consumer price index or whatever uh, price indices uh, uh, tend to uh, overestimate uh, real price uh, development. So if your uh, inflation indicator shows 1% inflation, but in reality there may be 0% inflation, so uh, you must aim at achieving some positive inflation uh, 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 target rather than zero inflation. Second point is uh, uh, there continue to be some uh, <coughs> cyclical uh, movement, and uh, when uh, you need to implement uh, accommodative uh, expansionary monetary policy, uh, you have to have uh, uh, sort of policy uh, uh, room uh, to do so. And uh, in order to do so, uh, I think uh, you have to uh, uh, keep a reasonable uh, inflation target under which uh, your policy rate would be uh, some positive level and uh, you can uh, substantially reduce uh, uh, policy rate uh, in case of need and so on and so forth. So policy room, uh, monetary policy room is necessary. Uh, third, uh, after many years of uh, uh, trial uh, and experimentation, almost all central banks in uh, the developed world uh, have adopted 2% inflation target. And I think uh, this has become a sort of uh, uh, global standard and, uh, and under which uh, uh, medium long-term exchange rate relationship uh, between major currencies uh, tend to be uh, stable. So uh, all in all, I think 2% inflation target or price stability target has been well uh, established, and although some economists are now arguing for higher inflation target, 
or price, stability, price level target or nominal GDP target and so on and so forth. Uh, there may be a uh, <coughs> uh, good reason to, to consider, but at this moment, I think uh, after 10, 20 years of, uh, of experience uh, among major central banks, I think uh, this 2% uh, uh, or so uh, inflation target should better be maintained uh, for uh, uh, price stability and sustainable economic growth. Mark Carney, 30 uh, seconds. Very quickly to the last question. Um, I think, you know, Ben Bernanke's um, idea on temporary price level targeting in very clear circumstances and making it clear ex ante that that's a possibility um, is an interesting idea. Uh, we looked at it in the UK in the throws. It's hard to do because of the quality of the data. Also, it's tough to do in the middle of that circumstance. Um, and obviously what Ben and Charlie Evans previously had proposed is different than that. Um, so it merits some consideration um, in you know, quiet seminars in good times. It's an example of potentially fixing the roof while the sun, sun shines. The only point I would make, if I may, is I don't think the monetary policy in the macro policy tool was the mishandled element, and I've been saying this now for 10 years, the mishandled element was fiscal policy, and we really have to go, not, it was used very effectively very early, and it was withdrawn, the stimulus was withdrawn much too soon, and that created some very big problems. Now. I have minus 10 seconds, so I'm going to summarize our wonderful discussion in the following five unbelievably uh, quick points. One, we have a wonderfully strong recovery, which is certainly cyclical, and we want to make structural. Second, there is a consensus on this panel of those who are not responsible for all this uh, um, that the official sector has done a wonderful job in getting us here. And since uh, for, this is a time to be generous, I'm going to go along with that fully. Uh, but of course, in all other days when I write my, um, <laughs> my columns, I'm definitely not bound by that, uh, by that recognition. But I think it is fair. It could have been very much, very much worse. And in the interwar period, it was. Three, two, three, this is, provides us with a serious opportunity to improve policy on a whole range of dimensions, and uh, Christine Lagarde particularly has emphasized some of the most important, which include the distribution of the benefits of growth. Fourth, the only thing to fear is the absence of fear itself. Well, there are many other things to fear, but the absence of fear always terrifies me, particularly when it's in the markets. Um, though we have been told very confidently by someone I always believed, namely the governor of my own central bank, that the financial sector itself is pretty strong. And finally, if we're thinking about fear, beyond the financial sector and the possible meltdown of asset prices, whatever that might do, there are plenty of significant domestic political global geopolitical and geo global economic challenges um, such as trade policy and beyond that we discuss climate. So if anyone leaves this hall feeling the complete abstinence of fear, then I suspect they're in the wrong job and in the wrong place. <laughs> and with that, may I thank the panel for a wonderful discussion. Thank you, Mark.